Hey guys, today we're going to talk about private placement memorandum. In the world of securities, memorandum kind of means a disclosure document. We can sometimes call it a Form S-1, be filing for a public company, or a Form 1A to file for a Regulation A offering, or a Form C for filing a Regulation CF offering. Oftentimes they're referred to as prospectus. But in the world of Regulation D, where these are private offerings that don't get registered with the SEC, and generally nothing even gets filed with the SEC, they're called private placement memorandum. And that's what we're going to talk about today and just break it down into bite-sized, understandable components. All right, so we're just going to do this classic, I am an attorney, I'm not your attorney. This is just for educational purposes and to really help you make your own decisions on either raising capital or in this case if you're investing into a private placement a regulation d offering here's the type of stuff that you need to know we'll start with what are private placement memorandums we've already covered it it is the memorandum that describes everything about the investment that you're putting together or investing into we'll actually start with when there's a private placement memorandum that's put together, it's just a document. It can be on the short end, 30 pages, on the long end, 100 pages, with all the exhibits, hundreds of pages. But it is a complete look through of the structure of the investment that you're looking at. So what is a private placement? Well, if you're offering securities underneath Regulation D, that means that you're not registering them with the SEC. You're not qualifying them with the SEC. You're privately placing the investments through certain marketing channels. They're generally referred to as an exempt offering or an unregistered offering, meaning that the SEC hasn't actually even looked at the investment at all. That's not to say a filing doesn't take place with the SEC. It's generally called a Regulation D, Form D notice filing that we do files kind of general information with the SEC. And then we also file this in every state that investors come in as well. I think the states are more interested in getting their filing fees, but at the end of the day, in every state, in almost every state, there's one exemption, exception there, a filing fee and a document, this Reg D notice filing, actually gets filed not just with the SEC, but every state your investors come out of, reside. And what does an investor residing in a state mean? Look at their driver's license. Where does it say they actually live? Where is their primary residence? What people don't really realize very often is most securities, most investments that are sold in the United States actually are these private placements. Just so that you understand, private placements are big business. Regulation D is huge because that's for the everyday company to raise capital. You can spend up to a million dollars or more trying to get onto the New York Stock Exchange. NASDAQ has all kinds of registration and other requirements to get listed there. We actually help do some uplisting of Reg Ds to registered offerings to NASDAQ listings. But there's only so many companies that even are able to get listed on NASDAQ with Regulation D and these private placements that we're talking about. It's unlimited. So there are more private placement investments than companies that are on the New York Stock Exchange, any of the stock exchanges, Regulation A, Regulation CF, throw them all together and there's still more Reg Ds for all of these investments than all those combined. Now, this is a little bit of a older news, but in 2017, more than $3 trillion was raised through these unregistered securities 1.85 trillion dollars was raised through Reg D offerings. And this is where it gets really important. Only 9% of the investors were unaccredited. Private placements are often really limited to accredited investors or those large investors, institutional investors, sometimes called qualified purchasers, meaning they have 5 million or more in assets. Now, when we talk about a accredited versus non-accredited investor. An accredited investor means that you have a net worth of a million dollars or more, not including any of the positive equity from your principal residence. Or there's, there's other ways to calculate if you're an accredited investor. Another one is if you're making $300,000 a year 
with your spouse for the last few years, or if you're making 200,000 a year and it's just your own income. And it's always looking back for the past couple of years with a reasonable expectation that you're gonna continue to make that much money. And if you're not accredited, then you're unaccredited, which is just as simple as that. Anybody that does not meet the requirements of an accredited investor is not accredited. And in the Regulation D space, there's one option, Regulation D 506C, which doesn't allow for any non-accredited investors. There's also Regulation D Rule 506 B, which you can't advertise, you can't market, uh, but you can, we call this friends and family exemption. You can accept a limited number, generally it's 35 or less, sophisticated but unaccredited investors. The real purpose of it is to provide to the investors all of the information, transparency, to make an informed decision of whether or not to invest. On the sponsor side, on the issuer side, it actually also provides the protection of doing what you say you're going to do to limit any baseless claims such as, well, you didn't tell me about this risk. You didn't tell me we could lose all of our money. If you look at, at a private placement memorandum, often called a PPM, there's generally 10 to 15 pages of all of the different risk factors, all the ways that your investors actually can lose all of their money. Sounds like a really horrible thing to put into a sales pitch for an investment. The PPM is not a sales tool. It is a disclosure document to allow that transparency to tell the investors everything about the company, the management, the controls in terms of voting, what fees management are receiving, what profits actually go to the investors, and then all the different ways that somebody can actually lose all their money. But while it provides that transparency for the issuers themselves, it provides that protection from the investor saying, you don't warn me about this. A properly structured and documented PPM warns the investors about every. Now the, the PPM itself, it's generally a 30 to at most a hundred page document written in, they call it plain English written in a simple, understandable format. That's not legally anyone should be able to read a PPM and understand exactly what's going on with the business. But it's actually supported by, and there's usually exhibits to, all of the legal agreements that come together to make the investment happen. As an example, if we're using an LLC, there may be a operating agreement or a company agreement. For corporations, there may be bylaws. And you can even do an offering of debt asking investors to sign on to promissory notes. So those are the actual legal documents for the legal clarifications and the legalese that are generally summarized within the PPM, but also they're attached, they're included as an exhibit. So the investors that care enough can read all about the agreements in the PPM, but the ones that are super analytical can actually go right to the exhibits and read exactly what the legal documents actually state. Secondarily, there's generally the marketing material. So you want to be able to provide all investors the information about, well, the investment and what the expectations are and the business plan. If there's any brochures, pitch decks, etc., they get included into the exhibits so that all investors receive the same information for them to make that reasonably educated decision whether to invest. Of course, not every delivery email is included, but if there's marketing materials, you're generally including 100% of them in the exhibits of a PPM. And then one of the most important things the subscription booklet. That's the suitability questionnaire for the investors to gather all of their background information, qualify them as can they actually even invest? Are they accredited or non-accredited? If they're not accredited, do they have the work or educational experience that helps them understand there's a chance of loss? of their investment. And then even if the investor is suitable, ultimately they sign an investment agreement. Oftentimes it's called a subscription agreement. If you hear subscription agreement, it really is the same thing as an investment agreement where both the issuer is making representations as well as the investor is making representations and agreeing to the investment terms. In terms of the PPM, we're calling it the five W's. The who, what, when, where, and why. Really, it's that completely encapsulated full transparency disclosure 
of what's a goal, what's the plan, and how's it all coming together to make the investors a profit? Who is involved with the offering? If somebody has a material of 10% or greater ownership, they have to be disclosed. Or if they're in management and they have management rights or management control, they have to be disclosed. What is being offered? Like I was saying, it could be a promissory note, it could be debt, it could be equity interest, there could be preferred stock, there could be common stock, there could be different classes, there could be just a profits interest. There's so many different ways to make an offering to describe what you're actually giving to the investors, but what that is must be fully disclosed and described within the PPM. The when does everything happen? The when is something that I want to really take a moment and focus on because a lot of the win is in the future. And so oftentimes I'm, I'm coaching clients who send over a business plan as an example, and it says, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And this is going to happen. But the reality is they're all forward looking statements, meaning you and I don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so we need to be very careful about describing that when everything happens. We preface it. Our intention is, our belief is, our expectation is this closing or this market event is going to happen, but it's all an expectation, a hypothesis, and it's not a fact until it actually occurs. Where does the money go? A use of proceeds should fully explain once the money gets into the bucket, where does the money go out from the bucket to? That includes if the investors are paying management fee or other expenses such as legal, accounting, broker dealer, any sales expenses if you're paying somebody a commission to raise the capital. And then ultimately, are you using it for how much into purchasing a property or how much is going into research and development of your company? You have to break it down so that people understand how the funds are going to be used. Now I say that how the funds are gonna be used, again, we can't be certain about the future. So really this where the money goes, it's a best guess based on the date of the memorandum. And if it changes materially, maybe you have to supplement or update those use of proceeds. But if it changes so much, hey, instead of buying real estate, you may be buying a business. You may have to go back to the investors and say, hey, the plan has changed. The use of the money has changed. The issuer has changed. Do you still want to continue as an investor? And that's a good reason why we'll use often an escrow agreement if things are not super figured out already. And then the last W, why? Why is the offering being made? That's that story of what you're trying to accomplish. What are your goals? And if you're targeting a particular market, or you're targeting a particular industry, tell us about that industry. What background information do you know? And why is your company going to excel once it has these, this capital funding in success in whatever your, your ultimate goals and plan may be? To go a little bit deeper into the who. The who starts with what company is actually selling securities? The issuer itself. You got to describe when it was formed. Is it a brand new company, which we prefer because there's less to disclose? Or has it been a company that's been in operation? And is there a history that needs to be disclosed? Who is actually in charge of the management? For management with an LLC, it's the individual person that may be managing if there's a management entity involved. Or if it's a limited partnership, there's oftentimes an LLC or a corporation that's serving as a general partner. There's a person at some point behind the scenes controlling and managing what's happening with the company. You have to disclose who that is. And with all these key principles, you're supposed to be including their bios, past performance. You even have to include the skeletons in the closet. To be a little bit more specific in terms of a bio, it doesn't have to be super illustrious, but it does have to include at least the past five years of business experience, including where you worked, what your title was, what you were doing. For past experience, past performance, you got to think of things such as, well, have you raised capital in the past? How did it go for those investors? What did you deliver to them? And here's the important part. If you've had some things go well, some things go poorly, you have to disclose everything 
if you forget about those problem projects and only talk about the good side, well, then it's not a transparent communication to the investors on the who, which can create large liabilities down the road. So it's an important thing to remember. And in terms of skeleton, if you've had regulatory issues, bankruptcies, criminal issues, felonies, or misdemeanors like perjury or stealing, they are required to be disclosed because it's really material for who the investors are investing with. And the failure to include that can be a securities violation in and of itself. And then of course, who can invest? Is it limited to that accredited investor only? What's the suitability requirement? At the end of the day, what needs to be qualified for the suitability, meaning the qualification of the investor before they're even allowed to contribute funds? When we talk about what type of securities may be described in the private placement? One option, it's called preferred equity. And what that really means is it's it's a interest rate that's not really an interest rate. It's a accrual rate that is paid to the investors when the company has the money. Depending on how it's structured, sometimes it adds up until the company pays. Sometimes it just doesn't get paid if the company can't afford it. But it's more akin to more like a debt. But it's a debt that you cannot default on. That's an important clarification. With preferred equity, it is a percentage return to the investors. It does sit in front of the common equity, but there's no defaulting if you're unable to make those payments on a timely basis. The common equity, just the regular good old fashioned ownership of a company, they get a percentage of the profits. They have voting rights and they're concerned about the profitability even more so than the preferred equity investor. Why is that? Preferred equity is paid, the debt is paid. The common equity gets all the upside of how the profitable company is operated, the common equity gets all the upside after all expenses and all preferred returns have been paid out. And so that's the one that really can adjust. Companies going well, common equity, profits are going through the roof. With a preferred equity, it's a fixed return. So it is more set. And like I was saying, you can also offer debt, a promissory note through a private placement. With that, you generally will have a maturity date, you have an interest rate, and you ultimately have a debt that you have to make payments on. And if you default, that could force you into a bankruptcy situation. And then which one of these types of investments makes the most sense for your business? At the end of the day, it's a deal by deal consideration. So it really comes down to what kind of business activity is being funded. I'll give you a, a simple example. I love convertible notes for your startup businesses. What's a convertible note? You're borrowing money as a debt. The investors are lenders, which they have a preferred position if there's ever a bankruptcy or liquidation. But if things go really well with your company, which we all hope and expect that they will, those convertible note debt investors can convert into common equity and enjoy the upside as well. So I'll, I'll do another talk on how convertible notes really work. But for the startup company, it's a fantastic way to get started with a limited number of investors to help you reach your goals. When it comes to the win, to dig in a little bit deeper, Deeper. When does the offering even start? Well, the offering starts the date on the offering memorandum and within the PPM, it generally states when the offering ends as well. It is possible to do an offering that lasts a year, but if you do a long-term funding through a private placement, you're actually still required to update and supplement the offering from time to time with current information. We read that to be at least once a year, you've got to do an update if you need to provide financial uh, statements, which really comes down to the rules and what you're targeting and how much capital you're raising. But at least once a year, you have to update everything to make sure that your PPM is current based on what's going on in the market and with your company. When it comes to when can you actually start spending the money that's being raised, I've talked a little bit about what a conditional offering is, meaning you can't spend the money until you can actually effectuate the business plan that you're planning to do. From a real estate concept, if you can't get to the closing table and can't close on the real estate, you shouldn't be spending the investor's money because then if it doesn't close, investors have a loss. Be ready for that loss. From a business perspective, there's a minimum amount of money that you need to raise or need to have in order to get the business launched. 
until you hit that amount of money, whether it's equity or potentially debt, it just comes together based on the structure of your company and your investment. Until you hit that minimum threshold so that you can start moving forward with your business, you can't spend any investment money. When will construction, rehab, or project development be done? Of course, you've got to be able to spend the money to accomplish these things within the business plan. But when it comes to, to construction or rehab, as an example, you got to own the property first. If you don't own the property, there's nothing to construct. There's nothing to rehab. With product development, it's a little bit more blurry because you can start working on your product. But you really want them before you start using investor funds to product develop, your business better be moving forward and raising capital, knowing that you have at least enough money so that you can expect to hit your product development goal. When can investors expect to see their dividends or their distribution? Very deal by deal basis. However, I can tell you that investors like checks and the more checks they receive, the happier they are. Generally, well, the sooner after the close of the raise, you're building the expectations for the investors while you're putting together the structure of the investment and the timeline of expectations gets disclosed to the investors through the PPM. But we have some deals that you expect to buy a property that's already getting rented. Distributions start month two. Other deals, especially like ground up construction, can take three or four years for the building to be built tenants to come in and the property itself to get stabilized. So it really does depend on a deal by deal opportunity, but it gets disclosed to create those investor expectations within the PPM. Very similar to when can investors expect a return of capital exit strategy. The exit strategy of the investor is really important to them of how and when are they going to get their money back? Of course, you have to think through, well, are you going to sell the company? Are you looking to merge with another firm? Are you thinking that, oh, this will eventually go public, so there will be a public market in the future? Or from real estate, when do you expect to sell the asset? Or if it's a fund, what's the process of getting the investors their money back if they need it? I can tell you, if you're creating a fund that's expecting to operate for 10 years or greater, you better have a mechanism to be able to return the cash to investors that, that need it. You'll start to get investor resistance if you have a horizon longer than five years. Seven years is still okay, but I've had people say, well, this is going to be a perpetual fund. We always want to be invested. And my response to that is always, well, what about when the investors actually need their money? How are they going to get it back? And there's mechanisms. You can consider what the net asset value is. So you have a floating valuation. There can be public markets that it gets sold into, but that generally doesn't happen with a regulation D offer. It's not until you actually do a public registration or a qualification through regulation A that these secondary markets start to appear. But it's always important to think through how are the investors going to get their money back? And then finally, again, this is that exit strategy of when the company will cease operations. When's it going to wind down? And what's the strategy for that to occur? In real estate, you sell the property, you distribute the funds, and then you go based on the operating agreement of how to liquidate the remaining balance and to wind down the company. With an actual operating company, you have to think a little bit deeper about what's the exit strategy, because ultimately the assets need to be sold or the company is getting sold off somewhere else as an entirety. But it's important to think through how long is the investment going to last? And even at the end of that investment, what's going to happen to the investors, the company, and the assets of the company? For us to talk about where, where does the money come from? Now we're focused on the fun part, the marketing, where I was referring to Regulation D 506B. That's a friends and family market, meaning you can't advertise it online. You can go talk to your friends and family, prior associates having a prior relationship. And what does a prior relationship mean? Basically, you have a relationship, you know somebody, you've communicated with somebody for purposes other than just selling this investment. You get a lot of different answers based on what attorneys you talk to, whether it's three phone calls, 45 days, you know, part of a, a, the same group that you actually know them, I, or 
go and play a long round of golf and really get to know somebody. At the end of the day, the prior relationship that is required for that Regulation D 506B will always come down to do you know the person? Have you communicated with the person? And was it for reasons other than just selling this investment? And the more interactions you have, the better and the safer that solicitation becomes. I've had plenty of people say, well, they've been on my email list for the last five years. I know them. And I'll always ask, a, ask that person, well, did you talk to them? Have you actually communicated with them? And when the answer is no, there's really not a relationship there. They're just receiving your email. And now to talk about where does the money go? That's that use of proceeds that you're raising money to put into the bucket. And where are those funds actually used for? And of course, if you're using a broker dealer, they're selling commission. There's offering expenses such as marketing, setting up the entities, setting up the documentation, hiring the attorney. There are fees that the manager receives, whether it's salary or specific fees and there are kind of standard fees that are very accepted and expected in different industries. So it's all about working with somebody that knows and can coach you on what makes the most sense and what would be acceptable for your investors in terms of your management fees. Then there's always capital expenses. What that actually means is paying money to buy assets. You invest $1,000 in cash. If I buy a $1,000 printer, that's a capital expenditure. It is now an asset of the company. Now I've got to hire people because that printer is not going to operate itself. So hiring people, those are working capital. That's to actually bring in the crew, bring in the people, pay the ongoing operating expenses to make sure that the business continues forward. And of course, you need that CYA, the backup, working capital reserves or operating reserves, interest reserve, all of the expenses that you just don't think you need, but you need to make sure that if it does come up, because oftentimes things cost more and take longer, that you have the reserves sufficient to cover that. And now once the company is in operations, the real estate's been bought, there's clients paying their bills. The distributions, that's the next step. With a corporation, you can call it a dividend. With an LLC or a limited partnership, you call it a distribution. It's all the same thing. It's just money that's going back to the investors. And just to touch on taxes, again, it just kind of depends on what type of entity or what type of investment you're structuring and operating. Oftentimes, especially in the technology space, we'll use C corporations. A C corporation pays for its own taxes and the investors don't get any tax forms unless there was a dividend that was paid out. On the flip side, you can have an LLC that has a partnership taxation. With partnership taxation, the profits and losses get distributed down and paid by the owners of that LLC or the partnership. And if there's depreciation or losses, that also goes down to the owner's tax returns through a K-1. K-1 is an IRS form that lets the IRS know and lets the owners know what their tax burden will end up being. Well, not really tax burden, but the amount of income or losses that flow through to the investor or to the owner's tax return. In terms of the story, the why, why are this company actually raising investor funds? That's where you disclose what the operations are in addition to where you expect the company to go, the future business plan. If it's an operating company, oftentimes financial information is required to be disclosed to investors. If you're raising enough capital, if it's a new company, there's no financial statements to even provide under Regulation D. Now, you may have to get under Regulation CF or Regulation A, literally audited financials for a brand new clean company, but you don't have to do that under Regulation D as long as you start with the new company, which we often like to if we are approaching a new opportunity or a new business to use a brand new entity, which ultimately limits the amount of risk for the issuers and the investors from the unknown things that often happen in the background or in the past of a company. And of course, the PPM, I've talked about this a little bit, describes all the risk factors. And with the risk factors, it's 10 to 15 pages of all the ways that the investors can lose their money. Why include this? Are you serious? You're telling the investors that they may lose their money and how they may lose their money? 
Absolute. It's the purpose of that transparency to communicate to the investors, this is an investment. There are risks to any investment that you enjoy the upside of the gains, or you also may have losses. And the risk factors go through, in general, broad strokes, all the different ways that the markets can change. You've got to trust the management to make the right decision. The real estate economy may crash. There may be a pandemic. It's amazing how some of these things that weren't seen as a risk in the past, today, it's a huge risk that you should be telling your investors, watch out for those pesky pandemics. But long story short, it does end up being a, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 pages of all of the general and more specific ways that things can go wrong for the investment and the company. Where it gets to be incredibly important to work with a knowledgeable attorney is the devil in the detail. A PPM, the private placement, is required to be written in plain English. It's supposed to be easy for you to understand just reading through it without any sort of special legal education. Then we get to the operating agreement, which is absolutely a contract, very legalese based. Now, those need to match up, even though the wording sometimes isn't exactly the same. And if you don't hire a good attorney to make sure it's all done right, you'll end up with situations like this, where one document refers to a sharing ratio. The other document says the manager may decide when to and what to distribute to the members, to the investors. These are really big concerns and we see hundreds of these things on a regular basis that aren't prepared properly and have a mismatch of terms between the operating agreement and the PPM. So if you're thinking about investing into one of these opportunities, you should be able to understand everything out of the private placement memorandum. But the reality is, unless there's a great lawyer behind it, always read the operating agreement and all the exhibits to make sure that you understand the particulars of what it takes to run the investment.